So very briefly, a little bit of background before we get started. As I mentioned earlier, the regulations were published in the Federal Register on October 4th of 2016. They're being implemented in three phases. Phase one went into effect November 28th of 2016 and puts into effect most of the regulations, particularly those that continue existing requirements. And Alicia, if you could forward um, by two slides, please. Thank you. Phase two of the regulations go into effect on November 28th of 2017 and include some of the new requirements such as behavioral health. With the implementation of phase two, CMS is also putting into effect new interpretive guidelines, which they're working on now, and a new survey process that combines elements of the traditional survey and the QIS survey. And then phase three, which goes into effect on November 28th of 2019, includes implementation of new programs such as QAPI and compliance and ethics programs. You can see a full implementation schedule of each of the sections on the Consumer Voice website. Our presenters today have decades worth of combined experience and expertise on nursing home regulatory and advocacy issues. We'll hear first from Eric Carlson, Director Attorney with Justice and Aging. We'll hear from Toby Edelman, Senior Policy Attorney with the Center for Medicare Advocacy and also from Robin Grant, the Director of Public Policy and Advocacy with the Consumer Voice. And with that, we'll start the presentations. Um, Alicia, if you could move forward to the next slide, I will then turn it over to Eric. Thanks, Lori. And we can move one slide forward, please. We talk about um, assessment and, and care planning. And just a general comment about the regulations, as you'll see, I think, through each of the presentations that we'll be doing today. Some has changed, but there's a lot of, of similarity as, as well. It's still, of course, based on the federal statute, which has been effective since 1990. Um, and so there's a, there's a lot of similarity. There's some changes on the margins and a few more significant changes. But if folks on the phone are familiar with the nursing home rules, you'll see a lot of similarity, certainly going forward. Although that being said, a lot of provisions that essentially remain the same have, have been moved from one section to another. So there's there's some of it, the changes have been new provisions and some of the changes have been a reorganization of existing of existing requirements. One of the changes that occurs throughout the regulations is, is an increased focus on person-centered care or resident-centered care and anyone who works in LTSS these days is very familiar with this concept. Um, you know, the difficulty is in the execution, of course, and we're, there's a lot more talk about person-centered care. Whether we see a lot of it in, in practice is another, another question. To, to move things forward, CMS now offers this de regulatory definition of person-centered care. And you'd see it's a it's a focus on the resident, and that's the, the basic requirement that the care that's being provided to the extent possible is not based on facility convenience or standard operating procedures the way it's always been done, but what the resident would need or prefer. Next slide, please. Um, and. Consistent with that is an accommodation regulation that's very similar to the provision that's been in place forever, pointing out that residents' preferences should be accommodated. There needs to be a reasonable accommodation of what a resident wants. And you'll see here that the standard is actually very stringent, saying that there should be reasonable accommodation except when to do so would endanger the health or safety of the resident or other residents. So certainly that's something the residents should be aware of, and it, a facility should not be turning down reasonable requests because they're busy, because it's not the way they've ordinarily done it, but it, because it would be um, inconvenience, inconvenience to, to staff members. You, you see here the standard is health and safety of the resident or other residents. Next slide, please. And here we'll, we'll talk a little more about the care planning requirements. Care, um, as has always been true, is based on assessment, 
followed by care planning. One of the critiques about the previous regulatory system was that it allowed facilities to wait an excessively long time for the development of a, of a care plan. If the longest possible amount of time was taken, it would be possible under the old regulations not to have a care plan in place for up to three weeks after the person's admission to the nursing facility. So to address that, the current regulations now require, I shouldn't say current regulations, the, because they're not, this provision isn't in, in effect yet, but the, the, the regulations are going to require that there be a baseline care plan put in place within 48 hours of admission. And you'll see here that this particular provision doesn't become effective until November of, of this year. Recall that Lori a couple minutes ago talked about phase one and phase two and phase three of implementation. Phase one of the regulations already in effect that don't reflect any significant changes from the previous regulatory requirements. Baseline care planning is something that wasn't required before and because of that it won't that requirement won't come into effect until November of this year. But it would certainly facilities would be well advised to start doing that as as early as possible. I don't, there's no particular reason why you'd need to wait 12 months. I mean, certainly, and it's certainly a good practice to have some sort of functioning care plan whenever a resident is in the facility. You'll note here that the re regulatory requirements are focused on the, the, the basics, the, the goals and the, the various orders relevant to the resident's care. Next slide, please which moves us into the, not the baseline care plan, but a further conversation about the complete care plan. Has to be done within seven days of assessment. Um, it's based as it was before on an interdisciplinary team, which sh should include to the extent practicable, the, the resident or the resident's representative. You, as you can imagine, it would be hard to, with a straight face, talk about resident-centered or person-centered care if the resident wasn't a big part of the service planning process. And so to, to emphasize that further and to make sure that the resident participates when at all possible, the regulations now require that if the resident is not participating, that the resident representative is not participating, there has to be an explanation which ex explains why that is. You, you don't want, um, well, you just want some assurance that the facility and everyone involved do everything possible to make sure that the resident or the resident's representative participates to, um, again, guarantee as much as possible that person-centered care is a, is a reality and, and not just a, a facade. Next slide, please. The interdisciplinary team. Um, the participants are similar to where they were before, as they were before. The member of food and nutrition staff is a new requirement, and also the um, the mention of other staff as requested by the resident. Next slide, please. And that brings us into the the contents of the the care plan. It's what the the resident um, needs to um, get to the highest practical level of of functioning, um, it should as much as possible incorporate particular preferences and should not be limited to uh, quote-unquote care. It's daily life, as anyone who is involved with nursing facilities know. It's it's not just it's not a health care exclusively health care. It's about your life, and if you're in a nursing facility 24/7, there's a lot of quality of life issues, just scheduling issues and choices and uh, activities and, and preferences that should be encompassed in a, in a care plan. One other thing that has increased emphasis in the new regulations is the discharge plan. There has to be more of a focus on discharge. There shouldn't be an assumption that once a, a resident is in the facility, he or she is going to be there forever. There, there needs to be a look at um, how the, the um, what steps are being taken to prepare for discharge out of the nursing facility. Next slide, please. 
and you'll you'll see that here as well. And um, you don't want to see a, a decision where it's just assumed that the resident, of course, will be in the facility forever. And because of that, the regulations require that if discharge is determined not to be feasible, there has to be documentation of why that is and who made that determination. Next slide, please. And just to wrap up this topic, the, the same advice that, that um, we've been given for years still is, is true, that residents need to, to be active in this process. It's not helpful to just go to a care plan meeting and say to the nursing facility, well, what do you guys think? The resident and the resident's representative should go in with some sense of what what the resident wants, what would be what would be good, and to and to push things forward. It's a it's a tremendous tool, um, but it needs to be taken advantage of, and um, and those of us who who work in this field need to do as much as we can to support residents and residents representative in making this process meaningful. So with that, let me pass the conversation over to Robin to talk about some nursing services issues. Thank you, Eric. Um, so as Eric said, I'm going to discuss what's in the revised regulations uh, related to nursing services, or we just usually refer to this as staffing. And just to clarify, I'm sure um, Almost all, if not all of you know, uh, that when we say nursing services, we mean the care that's provided by licensed nurses. So that is um, licensed practical nurses, um, LPNs, or in some states they're known as licensed vocational nurses, uh, LVNs, and registered nurses, so RNs. So we've got licensed nurses and also uh, certified nursing assistants who are usually referred to as nurse um, aides in the, the regulations. So I'm going to talk about both sort of staffing levels and numbers as well as training. Next slide, please. So from our perspective, meaning consumer voice perspective, and I would say uh, from the perspective of, of many other advocates as well, we um, remain very disappointed um, that there's been no change in uh, the requirements for staffing levels and, and numbers. Despite the, the work of uh, many advocates, we still don't have a required minimum staffing standard, nor has there been any required increase in staffing levels. So I would just um, note that that is um, a huge concern uh, for us and, and other advocates. Um, staffing or lack of staffing uh, remains the biggest problem in nursing homes today. Um, we know that that is, without doubt, the number one complaint we hear uh, from residents and families and, and advocates. And we know there's a relationship between staffing and quality care. Um, but the new regulations don't include a minimum staffing standard, um, nor, as you'll see in a little bit, a requirement for a 24-hour RN. So that's what's not in the regs, but let's look a little more closely at what is in the regs. Uh, next slide. So there are some um, changes um, in the regulation relating to um, staffing. And I felt it was important um, for all of you to, to see the actual regulatory language uh, related to nursing services. So here's what the regulation says. Um, and forgive me as I, as I read this out loud. The facility must have sufficient nursing staff with the appropriate competencies and skill sets to provide nursing and related services to assure resident safety and attain or maintain the highest practicable physical, mental, and psychosocial well-being of each resident as determined by resident assessments and individual plans of care and considering the number, acuity, and diagnoses of the facility's resident population in accordance with the facility assessment required at section 483.70 little e. So as you've probably figured out um, by now, the parts that in re um, are in red are um, new language. Uh, next slide, please. So I just want to make a, a few points um, about this requirement. 
First, like the previous regulation, um, the revised regulation continues to require that there be sufficient nursing staff. So no change there. But there are two changes that impact what a facility has to consider in determining staffing. So first, there's what CMS is calling the competency-based approach. And that's a new requirement that nurses and CNAs, certified nursing assistants, have to have the necessary competencies and skills to keep residents safe and provide the care that they need to reach their highest possible level of well-being. So when you put that language together with sufficient, you get the requirement that the facility has to have sufficient nursing staff with the appropriate competencies and skill sets. So loosely translated, there has to be enough staff, and that staff has to have the knowledge, the abilities, and the judgment that are needed to successfully and properly care for the residents in the facility. So the question then becomes, how does the facility determine how much staff is enough and what the right um, competencies and, and skill sets are? So the answer to that in the regs is that it does that by conducting a facility assessment. So the goal of the assessment is to give the facility a way to determine what resources it needs to competently care for its residents. So this assessment is a new element it's found in the rules under the section on administration. And CMS is really viewing this assessment as a critical factor in guiding how the facility operates. And I would note that it's, um, you see reference to the assessment in um, numerous places in the regulations, not just in the part about um, uh, nursing services. Next slide, please. So among the elements the facility has to look at to, the, um, to develop the assessment are all aspects of its resident population. And you can see on the slide on the left side um, what has to be considered when um, assessing the, the resident population. And the facility also has to look at its resources. And you can see on, on the left, on uh, the right side this time, what those resources are that the facility has to consider. So that means that the assessment, in essence, defines sufficient nursing staff with the appropriate competencies and skill sets. Um, it tells the facility the number of staff it needs, as well as what competencies and skill sets are needed. Um, so this assessment, in, in CMS's words, is really about the facility knowing itself, knowing its residents, and knowing its staff. Next slide, please. So how often this assessment has to be carried out is pretty much left up to the facility, with the exception that it has to be reviewed and updated at least annually and whenever there's a significant change. So, for instance, if the facility began admitting residents who needed bariatric care and it hadn't been providing that care in the past, it would uh, certainly need to update its assessment because its resi resident population has changed. So before I move on, I, I want to point out that the facility assessment requirement doesn't go into effect until phase two. So that's um, November of, of this year. So because the sufficient nursing staff with the appropriate competencies and skill sets requirement is tied to that facility assessment, that whole requirement um, about you know, sufficient nursing staff with the appropriate competencies um, won't go into effect um, until phase two as well. So just wanted um, to point out the, the time frames here. Next slide, please. So the second aspect of staffing that I want to briefly highlight is training. So for the first time, facilities will have to have an ongoing training program 
for all staff. And the regulation specifically says that that includes existing staff, new staff, and also contract employees and volunteers. So of course um, this applies to all staff, but because that includes nurses and, and CNAs, I um, wanted to specifically point out this training requirement since it, it, it applies here. Next slide, please. So the rule lists some of the topics that have to be included in training. And you can see those topics um, on this slide. They include um, communication, residence rights, abuse, neglect, and exploitation, and, and, and more. So one thing I, I want to particularly um, note is the requirement that uh, for the first time, all staff will have to be trained in dementia management, which from our perspective is, is um, a very good requirement. However, the regs don't say how much training must be provided. That's to be determined by the facility assessment. So again, um, this underscores the importance of, of that assessment. This requirement for all staff training on these topics uh, goes into effect in phase three, with the exception of training on abuse, neglect, and exploitation. And that is already in effect. It was implemented uh, with phase one. Next slide, please. In addition to the training requirement for all staff, uh, which obviously includes CNAs, the in-service training requirement for nurse aides has been revised in a couple of ways. So first, it includes dementia management training and resident abuse prevention. That must be part of nurse aid in-service training, so that's new. And this part has already gone into effect. Um, and second, um, when facilities determine um, what training, what in-service training to provide to address areas of weakness, of nurse aides, they have to look at their facility assessment to get a sense of, of what areas should be discussed and, and addressed in that training. Right um, in the past, they have based um, the training to address areas of weakness solely on nurse aide performance reviews, so now they will um, they will have to, or when this goes into effect with the facility assessment, they will have to look not only at the performance reviews, but also at what their assessment is telling them. Next slide, please. So I think um, Eric referred to there's some new things, there's some old things. So something old, something new, with a lot of old. Frankly, um, you can see on this slide that uh, the provisions, um, many of them under nursing services, have stayed the same, such as you know, hiring of nurse aides, posting of nurse staffing information. But one other requirement that, from our perspective, unfortunately has stayed the same is the requirement for a registered nurse eight hours a day, seven days a week. And we had, um, along with others, uh, really advocated for this to be changed to 24 hours a day. Um, but that didn't happen. And I will say that we continue to be very concerned about the lack of the assessment, intervention, and treatment skills um, of a registered nurse. Um, and we feel that, that really those, those skills um, need to be available round the clock. Um, and not just eight hours a day, seven days a week, and that um, without having an RN 24 hours a day, residents really are, are placed at risk. But um, that is a fight for another day. So with that, I'm going to turn the program over to Toby, who's going to talk with you about um, unnecessary and antipsychotic drugs. So Toby. Okay, thank you, Robin. The revised requirements of participation participation changed the regulations for drugs in some very significant ways. Some of them are good and some of them are not quite so good. Until the revision last year, the quality of care regulations addressed drugs in a subsection called unnecessary drugs. And this section said that residents should be free of unnecessary drugs 
which it defined as drugs with excessive dose, excessive duration, without adequate monitoring, without adequate indications for use, or in the presence of adverse consequences which indicate the dose should be reduced or discontinued. A subsection of unnecessary drugs in the quality of care requirement of participation was antipsychotic drugs with two provisions. First, these drugs shouldn't be given to a resident unless they are necessary to treat a specific medical condition which has been both diagnosed and documented in the medical record. And secondly, even then, even if the drug is appropriate, it should be subject to gradual dose reduction. Next slide, please. The revised requirements of participation that went into effect largely in November 2016 moved these provisions to a different requirement of participation. Unnecessary drugs and antipsychotic drugs are now in pharmacy services. This is a concern for a number of us because we thought that the standards of care for facilities should be in a single place, that it makes more sense to have all the standards that facilities need to meet to be in one location so that they could be found easily by residents, advocates, families, and everybody else. Uh, however, CMS chose instead to move these rules to pharmacy services. The part of pharmacy services that addresses unnecessary drug prohibitions is identical to the language that we had in the older regulations. So again, unnecessary drugs are excessive dose, excessive duration without adequate monitoring, and so on. A second big change, though, is that the new requirements for the first time address four categories of psychotropic drugs, not just antipsychotic drugs, which were the focus of the prior regulations, but also now for the first time antidepressants, anti-anxieties, and hypnotics. On the one hand, it's a good change because we know that facilities, believing they couldn't use antipsychotic drugs, shifted residents to different psychotropic drugs and used them for the same inappropriate purpose of sedating residents and making them quiet. So that's good to have attention to other psychotropic drugs. On the other hand, the change is somewhat troubling because it removes the focus on antipsychotic drugs. And we know that these drugs are seriously misused uh, with nursing home residents, actually for all older people, but we're focused on nursing home residents. There have been reports uh, to Congress for decades about the inappropriate use of drugs like this for residents. Most recently, the Inspector General's report about six years ago indicated that you know, practically 90%, if not more, of the antipsychotic drugs are prescribed for residents who have dementia, not a psychosis. The Food and Drug Administration says the use of antipsychotic drugs for residents with dementia can be life-threatening. The Beer's list of inappropriate drugs says um, that they, antipsychotics are inappropriate for all older people. And CMS has had a campaign for more than five years on the misuse of antipsychotic drugs. So there's some concern that some of us have that broadening the attention to all psychotropic drugs, not just antipsychotics, is something of a problem. This expansion uh, of concern to these four categories of psychotropic drugs doesn't take effect until November of this year. But the same rules that were applied solely to antipsychotic drugs in the past, not being given unless they're necessary to treat a specific medical condition and gradual dose reduction, those rules in the revised requirements of participation apply to all four categories. Next slide, please. The new rules for the first time also address PRN, or as-needed psychotropic drugs. But the rules are different for antipsychotics and for the other four categories. For the three new categories of psychotropic drugs, uh, as-needed orders are limited to 14 days, although the physician can document in the medical record why a, long, a longer order is appropriate. But for antipsychotic drugs, an order for more than 14 days of as-needed uh, as needed antipsychotics is appropriate only if the physician evaluates the resident. And in the discussions about the interpretive guidelines, 
that will give further meaning or further explanation of the regulatory language. We had a lot of discussion about what evaluation means, whether it means an in-person examination by the physician or not. We don't know how CMS is going to uh, come down on that issue, whether an in-person examination is required for those PRN orders for antipsychotics exceeding 14 days. Next slide, please. The preamble gives us some additional information about the public comments that were submitted on the proposed regulations and how CMS responded. For example, CMS declined to adopt regulations that it had proposed in 1992 but never made final um, because CMS says now that they're too prescriptive. And it also indicates in the preamble that it accepted the public comment to extend the duration of PRN orders for psychotropic drugs from 48 hours, which is what CMS had proposed, to 14 days because uh, some facilities felt this, or at least there were enough, a number of public comments saying it was burdensome to have only a 48-hour period. Next slide, please. A second part of the, uh, the drug regulation is drug regimen review. And as before, a licensed pharmacist must review each resident's drug regimen each month. Next slide, please. What's new is first, beginning in 2017, the pharmacist must look at the medical record as part of drug regimen review. That's a good change, of course, and it should improve pharmacists' ability to evaluate the appropriateness of drugs that are prescribed. A second new change is that the pharmacist must advise the medical director of any irregularities that are found in the resident's drugs. Until these rules, the pharmacist was required to inform only the attending physician and the director of nursing. So this is a good change if the medical director is actually an independent person and not the attending physician for all of the residents, in which case it would just be a redundant requirement. But the third change that's also quite important is that the physician must document that he or she reviewed the pharmacist's report and made the changes that were recommended or explained the rationale for not making changes. And in the past, I think physicians could ignore the pharmacist's recommendation without explaining why. So this could also be a very important change. Next slide, please. Another new requirement is that facilities must have policies and procedures for drug regimen review. Next slide, please. Uh, and the preamble gives some additional information or understanding about what CMS thought and the decisions that it made. So one concern we had was that uh, CMS declined to um, require the independence of the consultant pharmacist, which it had proposed back in 2011, but declined to make final um, in 2012 saying it would look for additional information. Some of us hoped that in these new requirements of participation, the independence of the consultant pharmacist would be confirmed, but that did not happen. So I think there are some very important changes here, but it's also important for residents and their families and representatives and advocates to be vigilant and to use the tools we have. It's important to stay involved in the drug prescribing um, because, as I mentioned, we know antipsychotics are inappropriate for most residents. So unless a resident has a long-standing psychosis and the antipsychotic drugs are medically appropriate for that individual, it's important to question if a resident suddenly gets antipsychotics prescribed or suddenly, as we've heard happening and seen in survey reports, the resident suddenly gets a new diagnosis of psychosis to justify use of an antipsychotic drug. So it's important to stay on top of these issues. Secondly, even though the regulations on drugs don't explicitly say that residents have the right to give informed consent to specific drugs, the rules and the preamble make very clear throughout that residents have a choice and control over their health care, all aspects of their health care and aspects of their lives. And this, of course, includes drugs. So finally, we would encourage people to make sure that assessment and care planning includes discussion of drugs. Residents and their families and advocates should not hesitate to use the process, as Eric described at the beginning of this webinar, to understand the drugs that are being prescribed, to question the appropriateness of these drugs, and to say no to drugs that should not be prescribed. 
So Eric, back to you for uh, transfer and discharge now. Thanks, Toby. Let's start with the, the six reasons for transfer discharge. These are familiar to anyone who's d done nursing facility work. The red language here indicates some changes that are made. So the standard six reasons that everyone are, are familiar with. The, the first change noted here is that the safety of others is purportedly limited by the requirement that this applies only when this endangerment is due to the clinical be or behavioral status of the resident. Um, although I've got a note here that I don't know how much limiting that actually does. That in most cases when supposedly the safety of others in the facility is, is endangered, the allegations relate to the clinical or behavioral status of the resident. The second change is likely more useful. This is a provision that in the past was in the surveyor's guidelines and now has been upgraded to the regulations. And it states that there can't be non-payment, there can't be an involuntary transfer discharge for non-payment if the resident has submitted the necessary paperwork to a third-party payor. And this most frequently comes up in situations where there's a pending Medicaid application. And when that happens, the facility cannot move to force the resident out for, for non-payment. The Medicaid application has to, the processing has to be allowed to um, go, on to its, go on to its conclusion, which of course is completely fair to the, to the resident in that, in that situation. Next slide, please. This is something that's new and is likely to be useful, I think. A lot of times, um, you see allegations by facilities that they can no longer meet the, the resident's needs. And um, in my experience, in my opinion, it's oftentimes cited in situations where the facility really could. The, the resident may be difficult. The resident may be heavy care. There may, there may be some complications in, in providing care. But there's nothing about that resident that says his or her needs cannot be met in a nursing facility. And in practice, you, I think you see that demonstrated all the time because nursing facility A will propose transferring the resident to nursing facility B. And so then the argument to the first nursing facility always goes, well, if the second nursing facility can deal with this person, why can't you? And this requirement addresses that. If a facility alleges that it can't meet the resident's need, the record's got to include the specific need that purportedly cannot be met. There has to be documentation of attempts by the nursing facility to meet the resident's needs and a listing of the services available at the receiving facility, right? nursing facility number two, that allows that facility purportedly to meet the resident's needs. I'll note another regulatory requirement here. There's a separate a separate provision of the regulations that it, at admission requires the nursing facility to provide notice of, quote, the special characteristics or service limitations. I know that th that um, language didn't seem, um, seemed a little dangerous to, to, to me and others that, that do this kind of advocacy because it seemed to to give the facility some encouragement to supposedly um, limit the services that it that it um, provides, possibly below that from what should be required by law. But in this particular circumstance, it might be cited useful by residents if a facility is arguing it it, it can't meet the net resident's needs. One argument by the by the resident, the resident representative, could be. Look, you didn't say that in admission. We would have no way of knowing that you supposedly cannot meet this particular need. You were required to give us notice at the front end of any service limitations you have, and you failed to do so. Next slide, please. Some, some new protections. The, the first one, I think, was the way it usually worked in any case, or the way it should have worked in any case, that people weren't, shouldn't have been transferred out while their appeal is, is pending. 
and the regulations now explicitly say that. They're skipping down to the third bullet point there. The facility has to assist the resident in completing the form, so not to prosecute the appeal, of course, because the facility can't be arguing against itself, but just to provide log logistical assistance in getting the transfer discharge appeal filed. And then finally, going back to the middle bullet point, the facility now is required to send a copy of the transfer discharge notice to the long-term care ombudsman program. And this does not require the resident's consent. The facility should just be doing it in every instance. And the idea being that residents need some support and they need some information. And too frequently, residents, when they get a notice, they don't know, they're scared. They don't know particularly what to do. They're intimidated by the, the whole process. And they just pack up and, and move away. Um, if the notice, on the other hand, goes the nurse to the ombudsman program, the ombudsman program can speak to them, counsel them, give them some suggestions, give them some support, and help them through this process. There's been a fair amount of, of conversation, I think, prompted by this requirement, um, looking into when notice has to be required. Um, I've had to, I had an inquiry about this just within the last hour and a half, and um, or two hours, and um, and I think that be, because of this requirement, there's been some concern that ombudsman programs will get buried in all these notices, and that facilities have to give notices every single time a, a resident ever leaves a facility, whether it's involuntary moves out of the facility, whether that's involuntary or not. And that's, um, that's never been true in, in my experience, that when our, their facilities have never been giving these kind of transfer discharge notices, when a person just chooses to, to go back home or to, to, to move elsewhere, the operative provision, which is still operative, it's a provision in the interpretive guidelines, it says that the involuntary transfer discharge rules apply, um, quote, to transfers or discharges that are initiated by the facility, not by the resident. Whether or not a resident agrees that with, to the facility's decision, these requirements apply whenever a facility initiates the transfer discharge. So that's, that's been the standard in the past. It remains the, the standard. So if, you know, um, if a um, facility initiates a transfer discharge, if they give out a transfer dis uh, the, the notice that says you have to get out, or if they say, look, you have to, to get out, or if they say your, your, re your um, Medicare stay here is ending, we, we, um, you don't have a right to stay here anymore because we only want you under Medicare, whatever it is, whatever, whenever it's being initiated by the, by the facility, then the facility has to give that notice and appropriately ha has to then include that notice to the ombudsman program. If, on the other hand, it's the move is from the resident's initiative, then it's not an involuntary transfer discharge and this process is not initiated. Next slide, please. There's some improvements here on the returning to the facility after a hospitalization, for example, that um, as has always been true, the facility has to give notice of a, a bed hold policy. Also, as has always been true, if the resident is Medicaid eligible, the resident has a right to return to the next available room in the nursing facility, regardless of the, the length of the hospitalization and regardless of whether there's been a, a bed hold. So if I'm in a hospital for six weeks and I want to get back to the nursing facility, the Medicaid program hasn't paid for an empty room for six weeks, but I'm entitled to get back to the next available space. And if my old room is available at that point, I have to be allowed to move back there. Next slide, please. And then there's some good language, I think, in, in most situations about preventing this resident dumping where the resident goes to the hospital and the facility says we don't want to we don't want to take you back it's essentially a, a lockout um, and in in 
in most advocates' opinions, an, an evasion of the transfer discharge rules. Rather than going by following the process, the facility just says, we're not taking you back, um, which puts an incredible burden on the on the resident who's likely in a hospital that doesn't intend to retain him or, to, him or her for more than another day or two. So the, the language is, is better in this case. It makes it clear that if a facility makes a claim like that, the facility has to comply with the transfer discharge regulations. And, um, and I would suggest that that means that when you've got this, these kind of situations, and the facility claims that it can no longer meet the person's needs or whether or there's non-payment or whatever the reason is, and those allegations are made regarding a resident who's currently hospitalized, the obligation of the facility is to readmit the to, to accept the return of the resident and continue with the with the process. That's what this says. And also you recall that regulatory provision we talked about a couple minutes ago that says there there can't be a transfer discharge carried out until the appeal process is complete. And all of that, and just basic fairness to the resident suggests that if there's allegations by the facility, the facility cannot take advantage of a hospitalization and instead has to, to give the proper notice and um, allow the resident to return and to to follow whatever appeal processes that may be available to him or to her. Next slide, please. Um, just very quick rules. These are the same tips I would have given six months or, or a year ago. Don't move out. If you um, can't tell you how many times residents panic, move out, and then call up and say, oh, I think that was, that was inappropriate. Well, it's a little late at that point. People need to, um, to hang in there and go through the appeal process. The law is actually very good. It, the administrative hearing officers may vary in their inclinations from state to state or county to county, but the law is, is really strong and in favor of, of residents. And it's appropriate to look at what the facility needs to do. Go back and look at that care planning process. You shouldn't be blaming a resident with dementia for behaving in, in certain ways when the, that kind of behavior is just a, a um, expected, a, a completely um, normal way of behaving if you, if you have Alzheimer's or, or some other dementia. The, there should be some burden on the facility to care plan for that rather than claim that, that they're un, incapable of, of providing the appropriate services for some reason or another. So with that, why don't I pass the program back to, to Lori and we'll address maybe another issue or two and field some questions. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Eric, and thanks also Toby and Robin for your excellent and informative presentations this afternoon. We've gotten a number of questions in, and as we're getting those ready um, to ask, I want to just take a moment um, to update those of you on the phone with some current events that have put these regulations, which are the quality standards in nursing homes, at risk. So. Um, first, Congress and the new administration are using the Congressional Review Act to attempt to roll back regulations that were published in the 60 legislative days prior to the end of the last Congress. And there are already at least 10 Congressional Review Act bills that are moving through the House and Senate. Uh, most of them are on different issues like environmental issues and things like that. But um, the revised nursing home regulations do fall within that window for possible repeal. And some in the nursing home industry have actively been promoting that they be rolled back. So obviously that's of great concern um, to us because as you've heard from our speakers today, um, there are some really positive improvements in these regulations, um, some updating that was needing to take place, um, and uh, we would not support having them rolled back at this point. Um, in addition, Congress has also indicated its intent to block grant or impose per capita caps on Medicaid, which will not only result in serious cuts to Medicaid affecting access and eligibility for nursing home care, but they're also intended to give states flexibility that could really seriously undermine or even eliminate the nursing home quality standards. So each of our organizations has been issuing and sharing information about these concerns along with things that you can do to help protect these important programs, action alerts, um, 
information about calling your members of Congress um, and, and different types of activities that you can do um, to support these programs. And so we would encourage each of you to um, look for and subscribe to our action list and to take action yourselves by contacting your members of Congress um, when asked, because it certainly is important that um, quality standards be maintained um, in the current um, standard that they are now. So um, right now, though, we're going to continue on with questions about these regulations. And what we are being told from CMS is that um, until they have been directed to change direction, they are moving forward full steam ahead with implementing these reg regulations. And so um, we have been also continuing our work in advocacy around um, providing issue briefs and training um, and additional things to um, advocates and consumers about uh, these regulations. So let's now turn to some questions, because lots have been coming in. So um, there were a number of questions um, related to transfer and discharge issues, um, particularly around the ombudsman program notifications. And Eric did address that some. And I guess the other thing we'll say about that is CMS is very aware of some of the challenges um, that are being addressed um, with that issue right now and is working on its guidance um, and are looking to actually um, send out the guidance um, fairly quickly since they know that uh, ombudsman programs are being inundated with notifications and there's confusion among facilities and also programs as to what needs to be um, sent to the ombudsman. So um, OK, let's go to a couple other of these questions. Um, so um, one question relates to uh, whether um, Sorry about that. One question uh, with respect to antipsychotics um, and psychotropic medications is around whether um, whether the rules re apply to antipsychotics for hospice patients. And um, I don't believe the rules specifically talk about that, but um, does anyone want to address that question? I don't think that there's any, this is Toby, I don't think there's anything separate in the regulations that says hospice uh, residents who are in hospice um, either do or don't get antipsychotics. I don't think there's anything separate in there. Maybe something will come up in the, in the guidance documents, but I don't think in the regulations. Does anybody else think the regulations have something to say about that? Um, not that I'm aware of. No, I don't think so either. OK. Um, another question is, how does um, a resident challenge the assertion that their condition or behavior presents a danger to others as we think about um, the reasons for transfer or discharge? Uh, this is Eric. Nothing's changed there that um, you just pr pr you know, you put out evidence that the person is not a danger or maybe f flip it and, and um, demand that the, that the facility present their evidence that supposedly shows that the person is a danger. In my experience, a lot of these are, are overblown, that you've got, it's, it's a resident with, who's physically frail with Alzheimer's that, that lashes, you know, that swings his or her arms around a little bit. I, anyway, that sort of thing, I think the, the point is to, put the onus back on the facility to, to back up these allegations to emphasize that facilities are set up or should be set up to care for, for people with, with dementia, and also to look back on the care planning process, that oftentimes there's a deficit there the first response in all these situations should be care planning, to try to figure out, to, to, to find solutions. And the facility instead moved to involuntary transfer discharge first. That's getting things back, backwards. Uh -huh. Thanks, Eric. There's been a, a couple Robin. questions. Oh, go ahead, Robin. I was just going to add that the requirements for training around um, dementia well, they, they phrase it as dementia management, I think, should um, help in um, defending some of these um, tra proposed transfer discharges. So hopefully that's another tool that people can use. Good. Mm -hmm. 
Thanks, Robin. Um, there have been a couple of questions about um, the assessment and care planning process around um, residents' rights to exercise preferences, whether it be the right to refuse treatment or also preferences that the facility um, does not agree with, such as maybe diet or smoking or um, or other types of references. So um, would any of you uh, want to address that qu questions around refer resident preferences? You know, this is Eric. I think the residents' rights still um, are, are in play. So I, I know that I cited the language that said that there doesn't have to be a reasonable accommodation if there's a um, endangerment risk, but that that doesn't change the right of the resident to refuse treatment. So, um, mm -hmm. so that so and that would trump in that situation. That's the that's the 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 right that would take precedence in in that situation. And regarding some of the other situations, it, it is reasonable accommodation and. Um, when you talk about what's reasonable, there's some balancing there. But in, in general, it's it, the resident has a right to to do things, and if the only negative consequences are to that resident, that should be within the resident's control, not the facilities. Now, if the resident's choices affect other residents negatively or are, are an undue burden on the facility in some way, that's something else. But if the purportedly negative consequences fall only on that particular resident, in general, that's a decision that the resident can make. Thanks, Eric. There have been a couple questions also about the question of discharge for non-payment and um, how it applies to a resident who um, is competent and takes care of their own finances and just refuses to pay their share of their bill. Well, if you refuse to pay, you lose. That, that's, I think, the short, the short answer. That, yeah. Uh, that's it. That if you if you don't pay, it's non-payment. Yeah. Um, the question about um, the issue related to hospital dumping. Um, there have been a couple questions about facilities that refuse to accept a resident back. Um, from a hospital stay. Yeah, that this, this is Eric again. That the difficulty here is in the mechanics, um, because if the residents in the hospital, that the, the clock starts ticking, and if the, the licensing agency isn't prepared to take quick, aggressive steps, then. Um, things are very difficult for the resident. There's a handful of states, California is actually one of them, that specifically have administrative hearing procedures to deal with this situation, really expedited procedures. But in the absence of that, it, it is can be difficult for residents and their advocates, and you need to, to hustle and complain and, and agitate and get the licensing agency on your side or file a lawsuit and get a temporary restraining order or enlist the hospitals to push back against this and um, you know object to, to essentially being a dumping ground or or some combination of all those things but that being said I think uh, we all recognize that the logistics of it are are difficult. The regulation is not self-enforcing. We've got more tools than we than we had six months ago, but it still really takes some work when you've got these situations. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Eric. So um, we are um, at the end of our hour for today. Um, I will say that um, for the topics that we cover today. Um, issue briefs have been prepared by our three organizations. They've been loaded into your um, control panels for the webinar and can be downloaded from there. But we'll also send around to all participants links to the issue briefs as well as the recording of today's presentation and um, the PowerPoint that's available for today. Um, and uh, hopefully the issue briefs will address a number of the questions that have come up. Feel free to call or email us directly.
um, with your questions, and, and we'll be happy to try and help you as best we can. And we'll be continuing also to release additional resources and information um, over the next few months on different areas of the regulation and different topics. Um, so with that, um, we'll close for today. I'd like to thank Eric, Toby, and Robin for um, your excellent presentations. And um, we'll look forward to talking with you next time. So with that, we'll close today's, today's call. Thanks, Lori.